This morning we're going to be in Mark 13, verses 24 to 37. We'll be finishing the chapter this morning. The title of our sermon is this, Jesus will return in power and glory. So let's read the text, open this in a word of prayer, and then we'll jump into the sermon this morning. Mark chapter 13, beginning in verse 24, here's what Mark writes and what Jesus says to us. But in those days, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Let's pray. Lord, I pray this morning as we discuss the return of your son. I pray, God, that you would give us all an eagerness, a desire to want to hasten it in our prayers, praying, come, Lord Jesus. We desire to be with you. We know that we have work to do. We know that while we wait for your son to return, that you have given us a command, a charge to go and make disciples of all nations. And I pray, Lord, while we wait, you would give Help us to be faithful to make disciples. Help us, Lord, to remember to make disciples in light of this reality that Jesus will return. To not lose sight of this, that this world is temporary. It is not permanent. Help us to remember that your word is permanent. That being with you in heaven is permanent. To live for that which will last into eternity. I pray this in Jesus' name. Uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, uh, we have been going through uh, Mark 13 and really kind of the theme and topic of eschatology and really more about persecution and Jesus preparing his disciples to endure and persevere through persecution. That's really kind of more of the theme that we've been going through. Uh, but let me get the context because we're at right at the end of the chapter uh, and we're going to be concluding this series that we've been going through. So let me get the context, bring us all to speak, and then I'll give an exposition of the text. And then I'll give application for us. So here's the context for us. Uh, at the beginning of Mark 13, Jesus and the disciples are leaving the temple for the last time. And one of the disciples comments on the beauty and the splendor of the temple. Now this prompts Jesus to tell them that one day the temple will be destroyed. The disciples, though, of course, want to know when. When is this going to happen? And what are the signs that will precede this destruction? But Jesus is more concerned with their hearts than with giving them signs. He warns them about being led astray. And after he does so, he then finally gives them several signs. He says there'll be wars, earthquakes, and famines. There'll be persecution from the government. There'll be persecution even from your own family. There will be an abomination of desolation, and there will be a tribulation. And this morning, we're going to get to some more of the signs that Jesus is going to give his disciples uh, about signs in the first century and then signs at the end of the age. And Jesus is also going to conclude with really what I've been trying to focus on in this chapter, more about their hearts in this. 
less about eschatology and more about their hearts in this, he's going to give them some more warnings and exhortations. So let's get to our exposition of the text. Try to uh, exposit this, explain this, and then we'll get into application. Let's start at verse 24 to 25, where Jesus says this, But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So Jesus says, in those days, after that tribulation, what, what tribulation? Well, the tribulation that he spoke of in verse 19. Jesus, we looked at that last week where he talks about the tribulation in verse 19. Now, this tribulation occurs either in the first century or at the end of time or both. Jesus says, after that tribulation, four things will happen. One, the sun will be darkened. Two, the moon will not give its light. Three, the stars will be falling from heaven. And four, the powers in heaven will be shaken. Now, Jesus is clearly alluding to Old Testament prophecies here. Things like Isaiah 13, Isaiah 24, Ezekiel 32, Joel 2, Joel 3. So, he's alluding to these Old Testament prophecies, but how are we to understand these events? Right? I mean, th th this language here is very confusing. How are we to understand this? There are two possibilities. Number one comes from, I, I saw this in a commentator by R.T. France. Here's what he writes. In the original prophetic context, such cosmic language conveys a powerful symbolism of political changes within world history and is not naturally to be understood of a literal collapse of the universe at the end of the world. And so what, what, what France is saying is that if you read the Old Testament context, um, it seems to me that these events are really political changes that are happening. Um, that's one way to interpret this. Second possibility, is other commentators take this to mean that there are actually may be supernatural cosmic events that accompany this. That there may actually be darkness upon the land. Remember, when Jesus died on the cross, there was darkness upon the land for three hours. So this could be literal, that there will be cosmic, supernatural cosmic events that happen. I think either are possible. I don't see a way to be dogmatic about those two possibilities. I think either are possible. Maybe both are true. Regardless, these signs will be the last signs before one of the greatest events in human history. As Jesus says in verse 26. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Once these signs happen, Jesus will return. He will Return to this earth. Jesus calls himself the Son of Man here. He says, you will see the Son of Man. This is most likely an allusion to Daniel 7, 13. That's where the title Son of Man comes from. Where Daniel writes, I saw in the night visions, behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man. Here Jesus is referring to what is commonly called the second coming of Christ. You may have heard that phrase before, the second coming of Christ. This is when we, the Bible teaches us that Jesus will return to this earth. Uh, we see this in the book of Acts, before Jesus ascended into heaven. If you remember, the disciples watch him ascend into heaven. He leaves the earth so that he can send the Holy Spirit. And two angels said to the disciples as they watch him ascend to heaven, they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the heavens? This Jesus was taken up from you into heaven, but he will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. So the angels prophesy, saying, he's coming back. And notice how Jesus describes his second coming. He will come with great power and glory. Meaning that his second coming will be quite different than his first coming. There will be very different appearances. Look at verse 27. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Now one question people might ask is, do you believe in the rapture? Right? That word rapture never occurs in the Bible. Um, but the rapture is the idea that, that, that Jesus will take his, his bride. Do you believe in the rapture? And my answer would be, and your answer needs to be, yes, of course. Of course. The Bible teaches that there will be a rapture. The point of dispute is when 
will it be? There's no dispute on whether there's a rapture. There is a rapture. The question is, when will it be? Right? It's a pre-trip, mid-trip, post-trip. We talked about it last week. But all three positions hold that Jesus will rapture his bride to him. They will be gathered to him. Jesus says that he will send out his angels, gather his elect. What is elect? If you've never heard this word before, elect here refers to those who are chosen in Christ to receive salvation before the foundation of the world. Those elect, meaning whoever is elect and is alive during the second coming, whenever that is, Jesus will gather them. He will gather them, rapture them to be assembled with him. This is the same language that Paul uses in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1, where Paul writes, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him. We will be gathered together if we are alive during the second coming, or whatever Christians are alive, we will be gathered together with him. Jesus says that he will gather them from the four winds. What is that? This is a reference to Daniel 7 as well. It refers to, I think, north, south, east, and west. I think that's. Another way to word this is as the NASB, as the translate, NASB translates this, from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of the heavens. And he will gather the elect from over the entire earth. They will all be gathered to him. In verse 28 and 30. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, part of the difficulty, this is, this is true for all apocalyptic literature, but part of the difficulty of interpreting this passage is that Jesus switches time here. I don't think you can make sense of this if you don't believe that. Jesus switches time periods. Here's what I mean. Verses 24 to 27 clearly refer to the end of time. Verses 24 to 27 refer to the end of time. But verses 28 to 30 go back to the first century. Verses 28 to 30 go back to the first century. He doesn't tell you he's doing this, but I think that's what he's doing. In other words, that phrase in verse 29, when he says, when you see these things, the question is, what things? What is he referring to as these things? I think these things in verse 29 refers to the abomination of desolation spoken of in verse 14. These things in verse 29 is the abomination of desolation spoken of in verse 14, which if you remember, happened in the first century when the Romans came in and destroyed the temple. The only way to read, I think this is important, because otherwise you can't make sense of this statement. This generation will not pass away until all these things take place. How, how can that be? How can that be true unless he's talking about the first century? Now, that it does make sense if we go to the first century, because this abomination will happen in less than 40 years. This is around like 30 AD, 33 AD. The, the abomination happened in 70, so it's only 40 years, which means that's plenty of time for these people who are alive to see this. So when he says this generation will not pass away, I think he's saying this generation that's living right now, as, I'm, as Jesus is speaking to them, you will not pass away until you see the abomination of desolation in 70 AD. That is what he's saying. And then Jesus here uses one of his most common topics for illustrations, agriculture. They were an agrarian society, so he, he speaks to them, and he uses agriculture as his topic of illustration. He says, when you see a fig tree, as soon as its branches become tender and its leaves begin to grow, you know that summer is near. In other words, if you didn't have a calendar, if you didn't have a, a watch, you didn't know what time of year it was, didn't know what day it was, he said, you could use the fig tree to know when summer is about to approach. You would know, like, right? And we all know this, right? When we're going for a walk and it's cold and you're tired of being so cold and all of a sudden you start seeing the leaves kind of bud and you're like, spring is coming. Summer's coming. Same idea. Likewise, he's, Jesus says that when you see all these signs 
that he just prophesied, you know that Jesus is near at the very gates. You know that Jesus is near. Now, you may be wondering, well, wait a minute, if we're back in the first century, which is what you just said, Matt, in what sense is Jesus near? In what sense is he at the very gates? I think the way to read this is, is we're living in the last days. When he says, you know that Jesus is near, right? The question of, I mean, we say this, right? When the Bible says the Lord is at hand, well, he's been at hand for 2,000 years. Jesus has been near for 2,000 years. We are living in the last days. We've been in the last days for 2,000 years. What this means is that, look, Jesus could return at any moment. For 2,000 years, Jesus could have returned at any moment. So I think that's what he means when he says he's near. He's at the very gates. In verse 31. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Now, heaven and earth here, I think you have to read this as a hint by it is uh, for creation, meaning that creation will pass away. So creation will pass away, but my words will not pass away. One day there will be a new heaven and a new earth. It will not be the same as our current one. Uh, this will come through one of two ways. Either a total replacement will get a new heaven and a new earth. Uh, earth will be different. We'll get a total different one. It'll start over. Or it'll come through a spiritual refurbishment. I, that's what I tend to, but if you like the whole replacement, that's fine too. I think that this earth will stay as it is, but it'll get a spiritual refurbishment. It'll return it back to the breed curse, whatever that is. But there is one thing that will not be replaced. There is one thing that will not be refurbished, and that is God's Word. That is the words of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The psalmist writes, Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Psalm 119, 89. Isaiah writes, The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Isaiah 48. Jesus said, Not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the wall. Matthew 5, 18. Verse 32. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Jesus says concerning the day or the hour. Now, I don't think anybody in this church is making this argument, but there are Christians who make this argument that we must not think, oh, yes, we can't know the day or the hour, but we can know the year. We can know the decade. That misses the point what Jesus is saying. No one knows. No one. Not any human. Not any angel. Not even the Son. But only the Father. Now, I know you're probably sitting there saying, wait a minute. Wait a minute. If Jesus is fully God, then that means he's omniscient. He knows all things. If he knows all things, how does he not know when he's coming back? How does he not know this? Paul writes in Philippians 2, 6-7, Though Jesus was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. What does that mean? I think this means that Jesus does not know in his human. That as a human, he does not know. In other words, just as Jesus' humanity was not omnipresent, Jesus' humanity was not omnipresent. God is omnipresent. Jesus is God. But his humanity is not omnipresent. Just as his humanity is not omnipresent, I think that his humanity is not omniscient. Like, but as God, he knows this. If you ask, is, does Jesus know this? Does he know it now? Of course. Of course he does. But as a human, he did not. I like what James R. Edwards writes. The commentator says, The disciples want an it. They want an it, a sign. Jesus wants a thou, the Father. Jesus' acceptance of his human limitation and his full relinquishment of the future into the Father's hands, the divine sonship is not something that sets Jesus apart from humanity. 
but binds him to humanity as an example to follow. In other words, when Jesus emptied himself, he became a human and he became just like us in his humanity, that he submits to the Father's will, saying, I am perfectly content to not know this. And he gives us the power to which to follow, that we can be perfectly content to not know when is the end of the world. Look at verse 33 and 37. Be on guard. Keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly, find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. I want us to see this word see in this chapter. It occurs four times in this chapter. You may not see it in English because they translate it differently. But the Greek word, blepo, see, occurs four times in this chapter. Verse 5, see that no one leads you astray. Verse 9, be on your guard. Verse 23, but be on your guard. And verse 33, be on guard. Guard. All four of those are seen. And I want us to be awake to this word awake. It occurs four times in this passage. Verse 33, keep awake. Verse 34, commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Verse 35, therefore, stay awake. Verse 37, stay awake. Eight times in this chapter, Jesus tells his disciples, be on guard. Stay awake. Eight times in this chapter. Be on guard. Stay awake. Now why? What's the big deal? You do not know when the time will come. What time? The time that Jesus will return. Jesus tells them a mini parable. He says, imagine if a homeowner left to go on a journey. And he left his servants in charge of his house. Each servant has a job to do. Some milk the cows, some feed the sheep. One of the servants' job is to be a doorkeeper. He is to stand at the door, and his sole job is to stay awake and make sure no one comes in. That's his sole job. But imagine if he fell asleep on the job. And imagine at the same hour that he just dozed off and fell asleep. Imagine if that was the same hour that the owner of the house would saw his doorkeeper sleeping on the job. See, Jesus says the owner could return at any point. He says it could be evening. That would be between 6 and 9. It could be midnight, between 9 and 12. It could be when the rooster crows. That would be between midnight and 3 a.m. could be in the morning. That would be between 3 and 6. His point is, he could return at any point. So what is, what is he stressing here? Here's Jesus' point. After all of this, after everything he's taught about eschatology and persecution, here is a central point that he wants to say. Don't be like the disciples who are sleeping in the garden when they should have been praying. Be ready. Be on guard. Stay awake. Stop there with that. I have six exhortations for us from this passage. Six exhortations. Number one, there is one indisputable truth in eschatology. Jesus is coming back. There is one indisputable truth in eschatology. Jesus is coming back. This is our last sermon on the topic of eschatology at least for a while. And I realize that some of you may be thinking, finally, <laughs> glad this is over. And others may be thinking, we were just getting started. As I mentioned last week, it's hard to know how much should we care about eschatology. I recognize that in this room, there is everything in between. There's some of you, you could not care less about this topic. And some of you, 
It's like your favorite topic in the world. You got a front row seat with popcorn. I realize we have those two extremes and everything in between in our church. That's true at every church. It's hard to know how much should we care about this. Here's the thing. We shouldn't, we can't, we shouldn't say that we don't care at all. Do not say that you don't care about eschatology. Do not make that statement. Why? Because there are significant portions of the Bible devoted to this topic. There are significant portions of the Bible devoted to this topic. The Old Testament prophets write about this. Jesus spends an entire chapter on this. Paul writes about it. And John spends an entire book, the last book of the Bible, Revelation, on this topic. And if we care about the whole counsel of God's word, we must not say we don't care at all about eschatology. So this doctrine matters. It matters. But we also know that eschatology is a third-tier doctrine. It is a third-tier doctrine, which means it should not be something that consumes our mind. We should not be in our basement graphing charts and spending our time doing this. And it certainly shouldn't divide us. Nobody should divide over eschatology. One of the most difficult aspects about eschatology is knowing what am I supposed to think. You know why? Because there is no shortage of theories and interpretations. You get online or you buy a book and you are going to get all kinds of theories, all kinds of interpretations. There is no shortage of this. Take, for example, tribulation. Like we talked about last week, should we be pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib? Should we read through the Bible with a dispensationalist lens or not? The millennium, should we interpret the millennium literally or figuratively? Should we be amillennial, pre-millennial, or post-millennial? The Antichrist, is this going to be a government leader or a religious leader? What country will he be from? The abomination of desolation, will there be a future one? And if so, what is it going to be? The mark of the beast. Will it be a literal mark? Technology of some kind? A vaccine? Are there signs of the times? And if so, what are they? The new heaven and the new earth. Will earth get destroyed? Or will it get a makeover? And on and on and on and on. Now listen. All of those points and more are disputed. All of them are disputed. But there is one indisputable truth that is not up for debate. And it is this. Jesus is coming back. He is coming back. You know, one of the questions that surrounds this topic is, on that particular piece, right, Let's, let's take eschatology aside. How much should I think about Jesus' return? Right? How much should I live in light of this? How much should I think about it? How much should I pray for it? How much should I, you know, how much should I think about Jesus' return? You know why I think, and I would imagine most of us here, if not like all of us here, maybe there's like one or two of you are exceptions, who don't think about Jesus' return all that much. Do you know why I, I, I think that we don't think about Jesus' return? all that much because we live in America. We have very good lives. We all have very, very good lives. But if we were living during a time or a place where we saw our brothers and sisters dragged off to prison, tortured, even killed for their faith, I would imagine that that was true of us. Our prayer would be John's prayer in Revelation. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Two. In the incarnation, Jesus came in lowliness and humility. In the parousia, he will come in power and glory. In the incarnation, Jesus came in lowliness and humility. In the parousia, he will come in power and glory. We could not envision a sharper contrast in the Bible than the two comings of Jesus. We couldn't envision a sharper contrast. In the first appearance, in the first coming, Jesus came in lowliness 
and humility. He did not come as a 30-year-old man. He came as a helpless little babe. He did not come to Rome or Athens or Alexandria. He came to Bethlehem. He was not born in a palace, but in a stable. He was not wrapped in purple robes, but the weakness of human flesh. He did not have a royal entourage, but a small collection of shepherds. There were no trumpets announcing his birth, just the lowing of cattle and the bleeding of sheep. His crib was not made of ivory and gold fit for a king, but was made of stone fit for feeding animals. In the incarnation, Jesus came in lowliness and humility. But when he comes back, they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds in great power and glory. Listen to how John describes Jesus' second coming. This is what John writes in Revelation. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe, dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation 19, 11 to 16. Now you may be wondering, why does this contrast matter? Why does this contrast matter? I'll give you three reasons why it matters. A, we don't have to fight every battle now. We don't have to fight every battle now. Listen to me. Christians are not on a crusade. We are not on a crusade. Jesus will fight against evil when he comes. And he will destroy it. B. I realize that speaks to probably one political side. I'll get to the other side. We don't have to worry about every injustice now. In other words, Christians do not need to be social justice warriors. Jesus will make all things right. Yes, there is tremendous injustice in this world. Yes. But when he comes, he will rule with perfect justice. He will make everything right in the end. Nobody gets away. Everybody gets judged in the end. Do not think that Jesus is like this nice guy. And you're like, man, that person needs to be punished. And then, like, you know, and Jesus will be like, oh, well, you know. God. No! He will judge them. He'll take care of it. Fear not. And see, we do get a Disney ending. We do get a Disney ending. Evil does not win in the end. The king wins. The king wins. I'm sure you don't miss that. I know it feels like as Christians we're losing often, right? We're losing ground, losing ground, losing ground, and we're not losing any ground. Jesus takes all the ground in the end. Three. In heaven, we will worship alongside believers from every tribe, language, people, and nation. In heaven, we will worship alongside believers from every tribe, every language, every people, every nation. Jesus says that when he returns, he will send out his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Now what this means is two things. Two things. A, nobody will be left behind. He will gather everybody. He will gather everybody. B, 
there will be elect from every part of the world. Remember what Jesus said in verse 10? He said the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. Now, some argue that this prophecy was fulfilled in the first century. Others argue it's yet to be fulfilled. But whatever side we come down on with that, one thing is true. In heaven, we will worship alongside believers from every tribe, every language, every people, every nation. John said in Revelation 5, 9, he's given a vision of heaven. He says, worthy are you to take the scroll, to open its seals, for you were slain. And by your blood, you, were ran you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Later, John writes in Revelation 7, 9, after this I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one can number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and standing before the Lamb. This means that when we get to heaven, we will worship alongside believers from North Korea. We'll worship alongside believers from Yemen, Afghanistan, Algeria, Somalia, Turkey. They'll all be there. The reason we send missionaries to the nations is not because we hope people will be saved. Oh, because Jesus has promised they will be. You wonder, like, why would someone be a missionary to North Korea or Somalia or Yemen? Why would somebody go there? Is it because you hope that somebody would say, no, not because I hope. It's because God has promised that they will be. There will be believers from every single tribe, people, nation, language in heaven. We give 9% of our total church giving to the International Mission Board. I don't know if you knew that. We give 9% of our total church giving to the International Mission Board. We give 3.5% of our giving. And then we give 11% to the cooperative program. 50% of the 11% goes to IMB. 3.5 plus 5.5 is 9. We give 9% of our total church giving to the International Mission Board. One of the reasons that we give that 9% to one single agency, to their individual board, is this. Because we believe that God has ordained His will is for people from every tribe, every language, every people group, every nation to be there. That's His will. That's why we give 9%. Four. Mount Zion should give us greater wonder than Mount Rainier. Mount Zion should give us greater wonder than Mount Rainier. We recently had our church retreat. We had about 34 people go. Our theme this year was wonder. Uh, probably better titled, I should title it, Wonder of God. It wasn't about curiosity. One of the things that I heard many people talking about during the retreat was wonder through creation. Doesn't that make sense? There's so much wonder in creation. Sunrises, sunsets, mountains, beaches, skies littered with stars, evergreens dusted with snow, meadows painted with wildflowers. God has given us oceans to wonder. But just think about the seven natural wonders of the world. The Great Barrier Reef, the Grand Canyon, Mount Everest, Victoria Falls, the Aurora Borealis, Paracutin, Harbor of Rio de Janeiro. Unbelievable beauty and splendor. You know, one thing that I still think is amazing, I still think this because I didn't grow up here, is that Mount Rainier is in our backyard. I love it. Mount Rainier is in our backyard. When I was a kid living in Alabama growing up, I used to wonder as a kid, what would it be like? I watch movies. I, used to, uh, I watch a lot of movies. And I would be like, what, what would it be like to live in a place where there are lakes and mountains in your backyard? And not just mosquitoes. <laughs> what, what would it be like to live in a place like that? And here we are. Here we are. All we have to do is 
walk outside. We could just walk outside on a clear day and see magnificent beauty. And Jesus says, all of it will pass away. All of it will pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Do you know what I take that to mean? I take that to mean that Mount Zion should give us greater wonder than Mount Rainier. You see, all I have to do is walk outside my house and walk down the street and I can see the absolute wonder of Mount Rainier. I can walk outside my house and walk a little bit down the street and I can look out and there's a clear view of Mount Rainier. That's all I have to do. And I can see absolute glory and splendor. But here's the thing. There is a much shorter walk to All we have to do is roll out of our bed and walk to the bookshelf. And there lies Mount Zion. In all its glory, there is my Savior standing on the Mount of Transfiguration, preaching the Sermon on the Mount. You see, brothers and sisters, there is a temptation to want to travel the world and see all the wonders of this world. I know this because many of you love to travel. <laughs> There is a temptation to want to say, I need to see all the wonders of this world. There is a temptation to see that. And listen, there's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But make sure that Mount Rainier or Mount Everest or whatever it is does not give you greater wonder than Mount Zion. Make sure that you are not so captivated by all the wonder in this world that you don't miss the beauty and the glory and the splendor and the wonder that Jesus has preserved for you and your soul in His Word. Do not be so excited to share about your pictures from your trip to France or Iceland or South America and you are so excited about the glory of this. Look how beautiful it is, but you can't share. You don't know how to share about the glory of His Word. Do you see glory in this? Because it's far more magnificent than anything you've ever seen. His words are deeper and they are wider than the Great Barrier Reef. His words reveal a deeper canyon in our souls than the Grand Canyon. His words rise higher than the snow-capped peaks of Mount Everest. They bring much greater color to our life than the Aurora Borealis. Mount Zion should give us greater wonder than Mount Everest. Jesus could return in five minutes, five hours, five days, five weeks, five months, five years, five decades, five centuries, five millenniums. They're all here. I looked up on Wikipedia, which is a dangerous thing to do. <laughs> how many predictions there have been in history about end times dates? I was like, how many like predictions have there been about end times dates? I counted 159. At least that's what Wikipedia says. Ranging from 66 AD to 2020. The vast majority of those 159 occurred in the 20th century. The vast majority. That is just the ones that are listed. The number is probably much greater than that. All 159 have been wrong. They've all been wrong. Do you know why? 
You know why? I'm going to give you some inside information. Inside information. Do you know why all 159 of those predictions have been wrong? Here it is. Because Jesus said, no one knows. No one knows. Plainly, clearly, unequivocally. It, 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 it's not a metaphor. It's not a parable. No one knows. Which means he could return in five minutes. Yes, he could return in five minutes. Before I finish this sermon, he could return. And he could return in five millennia. And everything in between. Now, you might say, well, what, what does it matter? How should we live in light of this? Well, there's two extremes. Two extremes um, that you can be on this. Either A, you could be 99% convinced that it will happen in your lifetime. 99% convinced that it will happen in my lifetime. Or B, you could be 99% convinced it won't happen in your lifetime. Those are both the two extremes. We don't no. So how should we now live then? How should I live in light of the fact that Jesus could return in five minutes or five millenniums? We'll talk more about that in worship and community. I'm going to give you two short principles. Two short principles for how now shall we live. A, share the gospel and make disciples as though he's returning in five minutes. Share the gospel and make disciples as though he's returning in five minutes. And B, perform your job and brush your teeth as though he's returning in five centuries. Perform your job and brush your teeth as though he's returning in five centuries. Six, last point. Be on your guard against being alive and asleep. Be on your guard against being alive and asleep. There is much to be on guard about, isn't there? There is much to be on guard about. You can be, be on guard against the dangerous effects of liberal thinking influencing our schools. You can be on guard about that. Be on guard against the tyranny and oppression of the government. Be on guard against thieves breaking in and stealing. Be on guard against mold and mildew rotting down your side paneling. Be on guard against small toys being put in your children's mouths. Be on guard against companies downsizing. Be on guard against the pick and roll and offensive rebounds. <laughs> Be on guard against mosquitoes and sunburn. There are countless things that can consume us and cause us to devote our lives to being on guard against this. There, there's no shortage. You can be on guard about everything in your life. Constantly on guard, on guard, on guard. Be on guard about everything. But four times in this passage, four times Jesus tells us to be on guard about something else. Jesus says, be on guard against being alive and asleep. Be on guard against being alive and asleep. You see, we have two options. We can be alive and asleep, or we can be awake and awake. You may be wondering, what does that mean? What does it mean to be awake and awake? Rather than alive and asleep, what does that look like? I'll give you some examples. It means not letting the triviality of this world lull us to sleep. Don't let the triviality of this world lull us to sleep. It means finding spiritual caffeine in our lives that will jolt us from our slumber. It means faithfully ringing the watchtower bell when you see the enemy advancing upon the church. It means feeling the heaviness and the weightiness when you are around the lost world. It means taking your discouragement and your anxiety to the Lord. So they don't cause us to seek escape through sleep or through intoxication. It means staying physically awake during the preaching and teaching of the Word. 
It means living a life of holiness so I am not a defenseless prey in Satan's Samaria. It means not waiting until the trial comes to start praying, but preemptively praying before the trial comes. Be on guard against 